late Anand Dutta. And uh, it was with the objective of carrying forward his ideals and his vision. And he was, um, he was uh, involved in a host of fields like education, sports, literature, and social development. And that is why we wanted to focus on all these areas and gradually, uh, you know, hone the talent of the budding uh, youth of, uh, of uh, Assam specifically. And we, we were more interested in focusing on rural Assam. And we wanted to uh, inspire the youth in leadership roles and bring about change. Uh, that is the whole intent of the Andhundatta Foundation. And um, uh, since uh, we are all, um, since 3rd October, the 9th October, we were observing the Mental Health Awareness Week. Today being the uh, day of mental health awareness, we decided to have a webinar on a very important topic today. And as you all know, the pandemic, the lockdown has affected us in a lot of ways and specifically the children uh, who are school going children and as well at the same time the parents to cope with the uh, you know environment at home with the children and a huge loss in the academic uh, you know uh, academic year of two years of these students so i'm glad that we have mrs anubha goyal we have mrs loya agarwal and Ms. afrin hussein who has joined us today to further enlighten us and uh, help us seek answers and understand the issues we've been facing throughout these uh, two years. I'm glad uh, the uh, members of the foundation thought of this and I welcome all the uh, speakers and all the participants in this webinar. I hope that by the end of this session we'll be able to understand a lot of issues and further push uh, our aim, our goal to make mental health awareness uh, more in the rural part of Assam where it's hardly seen as a problem or as an issue to be addressed. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ankita. Um, I think that was a lovely start to today's program. Um, before I move further, I'd request the participants that if they are comfortable, it would be really nice if they can turn on their cameras because uh, once the session starts, we will, um, you can raise your hands and we will be taking your questions at the end of it. But meanwhile, because we want to make it more participatory and celebratory, I would request uh, the participants to turn on their cameras. Moving on, um, I'll be now introducing uh, the esteemed panelists of today's discussion. First, we have uh, Mrs. Anubha Goyal. Non-conventional and progressive, her aim as an educator has been to mold young minds into confident, responsible and competent individuals ready to face the challenges of life and serve the nation efficiently. Mrs. Goel began her teaching career in 1981 and has taught in some of the best schools of the country. She was the founder principal of Sarla Bela Gyan Jyoti School, Kohati from 2003 to 14. Thereafter, she joined Royal Global School and is continuing there as a principal. Thank you for being a part of this webinar, ma'am. We're so happy Thank and excited. You. To Thank have you, you, Arpita. Pleasure being here. The next speaker for today's discussion is Mrs. Loya Agarwala. Mrs. Loya Agarwala is an experienced school counselor and personality development consultant for the last 18 years. She has been associated with several reputed educational institutions of Kohati and Mumbai. She has also served as counselor for the Assam State Women's Commission for a number of years. Her modern approach and fresh perspective in counseling has been invaluable in counseling the new generation of students. Two years ago, she started her company, You Can, which is a center for counseling and personality development. Absolutely delighted and honored uh, to have you on board, ma'am. Thank you so much for the introduction. The next speaker and the final speaker for our panel today is somebody very close to me. I have seen her in school and now to have her on board is, is extremely special for me and Umona as well. Uh, Ms. Afrin Hussain. Ms. Afrin Hussain is a counseling and forensic psychologist with, with an experience of over 10 years. She has been previously associated with Army Public School Narangi, Indian Air Force Gohati, Snehalaya Gohati. She is a consultant counseling psychologist to CBSE, conducting capacity building programs for teachers as well. She's currently associated with the Central Forensic Science Laboratory, Kamrup Rural, as forensic psychologist. Her interests include reading, nonfiction, poetry, photography and traveling. So happy to have you on board. 
happy ma'am <laughs> thank you so much thank you so much that was lovely thank you happy to be here all right so um without further ado i would go right into the questions that we have set because when we opened our registration forms we expected the students to have certain set of questions that would definitely help them in their journey forward so you uh, the speakers can definitely take a minute or two for their opening remarks but i would right away go to the questions and before that before answering that you can go ahead um with the opening remarks as well so my first question goes to uh anubha goel ma'am um ma'am we've seen that schools have started to reopen now and there is a high you know possibility for the third wave to hit soon and for the lower grades i think it 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 can become an extremely problematic situation so how do you think we can prepare these students in anticipation of the third wave that third wave that is about to come uh thank you first and foremost alpita for having me here this evening It's a pleasure being here with lawyer ma'am Afreen and all of you and of course the audience that's there the very fact that they are here means that they are interested in the welfare and the mental well-being of everyone else now to your question as to being prepared for the third wave see we all need to understand that the risk whether being at home or coming to school is just the same if we think that by coming to school we are more at danger i would choose to not believe that because we have realized that many of us sitting at home have also contracted the covid but the only thing is that we would somewhere or the other need to open we are making it mandatory for the children of 9 to 12 after the puja and the puja break but for the rest of the school it's going to be hybrid so for those who think their immunity is low they could be staying at home for those who feel they are stronger they could be coming but we do feel for some of them they would need to come to school now because i mean we are looking at education what exactly is education it's not just learning from the books it's more than that so for some i think we would need to get out of our homes for that social interaction with our peers so more than the risk of the covid i think what's more important is their mental well being as yes so i feel covid or no covid we want to open up for those whom we think are going through that mental harassment of being stuck at home in that environment and whom we think are looking forward to that social social interaction with their peers because end of the day more than anything else it's the mental physical and every well being of the child that matters studies would carry on that would never stop so i think that is my take if you ask me i think i agree school is so much more than just reading books and sitting for exams it's the overall yes. holistic development absolutely which they're missing out on so much so much absolutely yes. uh, thank you so much for that answer moving on um i have the next question for um loya ma'am uh we have seen that the transition from you know offline to online mode has made some students lazy and also disrupted their daily schedules you know leading to an unhealthy and disorganized lifestyle i think how anubha ma'am said that uh, they have this option of both online and online but some students might take the undue advantage of you know opting for online classes despite of um, despite of having not, not having any particular problem so even when schools and colleges have reopened we we are still seeing this lots of students they opting for online mode not just because of covid but because they are unwilling to leave the comfortable environment at their homes you know so how do you think they can be motivated to come back to their normal lifestyles and that disciplined or organized lifestyle that they had previously uh thank you for your question arpita and uh thank you to anjan dutta foundation for the your kind invitation um it's a pleasure to be here and uh and thank you for your question as well yes you are absolutely right we are at a very unprecedented time in our lives uh, in the history of mankind you could say where uh we will be looking back at this unique period of 18 months and actually wondering you know how did we get through a time when everybody was wearing masks everyone was uh, maintaining social distancing and how did these children manage to get through so many one and a half years of no school and yet education continued yes there have been many many 
negative habits that have been instilled in our children due to the lockdown, and very unfortunately so. Um, but yes, the transition is going to be uh, very, very challenging, not only for the teachers, but for the parents as well as the children. So I would suggest uh, these would be the kind of um, points that uh, parents should also keep in mind when children go back to school. Hopefully, uh, the children are already maintaining their, <coughs> excuse me, biological clocks and are getting up on time, regardless of having classes or not, because that's important to keep your body functioning normally, even though there may be no school. So body clock functioning, there is still time before school fully opens. So, you know, get your body clock absolutely functioning fine. Get your mental relaxation in order as well as physical and emotional, all of that must be absolutely on track. Also your food habits, I hope that Swiggy is going to go down and I hope more people are gonna be eating more healthier foods and less ordering online. I also hope that academics have been keeping up because it's so easy to cheat and cheat the system of online schooling you know, in many ways. And I, I hope that uh, you know, children realize that there is still time to get back on track but not to get too involved in all the social media and all of that. So there are many aspects of this rehabilitation of our children that we need to look at and I think it can only be successful when we have the cooperation of parents, teachers and children alike. It's an entire mindset, Arpita. It's not just a physical going back to school. Thank you, ma'am. I think that was extremely, some of, some of the points were extremely important and I think we all should keep that in our minds and I'm seeing some parents and elderly people here as well and I'm sure this is something that they need to look after for their children as well. Uh, but thank you for that answer. Um, moving on to um, Afin, ma'am. Um, uh, you know, at this point of time, we see that uh, there are many students, you know, who have faced trauma, different kinds of trauma during the pandemic. Could be because of their parents fighting um, at home. We have seen increased cases of domestic violence during the pandemic. And I'm sure uh, uh, it, it, all of this is causing a lot of trauma to the uh, children who now have to spend like 24 hours uh, inside those homes that they consider safe normally. And, and of course, loss of family members. So how do you think, um, uh, I think this is a question that we got uh, during our registrations as well. A lot of students ask this, uh, which means that they must be going through this. And, and how do you think they should co conquer the emotional breakdown and help themselves in such traumatic and trying situations? Uh, thank you. Thank you for the question. And thank you once again for having me here. Uh, now, my point is what I would like to bring to uh, the forefront is what exactly what you're talking about, the idea of the, the abuse that happens in the home, the trauma that comes from that. So here, what's happening is uh, we've I've read a lot, we've seen it happen, and we've been reading it even now that this pandemic has heightened abuse, exploitation, and exposure of children to violence, whether it's online or offline. So this trauma that is coming it can A, come from online classes and the social media that they're there throughout, okay? And that of course has heightened the chances and their exposure. The other thing is at home. What's happening is this is again, gender-based violence, mostly women and children, female children. The home where you're supposed to be safe, the home where you're supposed to feel protected is actually where a lot of abuse has happened. And in fact, my take on this would be, uh, I don't think many people, many children are aware of the helplines that India has, even all over the world. And here, when I talk about, you said, you know, school going children, I'm just not looking at the school going children that we would know you know, the schools that we know, the children that we know. We're looking at school going children from all this, you know, the different strata of society. And they are equally, in fact, I would say even more because they have the other risk factors. They have a poor social uh, uh, economic status. So in these cases, A, helplines are important. Child line, 1098. In fact, I just read a statistic that between March to June, March to June 2020, there were 3.9 billion calls that went to the helpline 
and out of which there were over two lakhs that were just for protection of children. So I would say awareness, A, of what's happening. Because if you're looking at a solution to a problem, you have to know what is the cause of it. Where is the abuse coming from and how do you report it? How do you report people who you are supposed to be, who are supposed to take care of you? So my take on this would be A, awareness, talk to somebody, helplines that can actually help. Helplines 1098 helps. And of course, talk to friends, talk to family, talk to trusted people. I think as we go ahead, I would like to talk a little more on, uh, you know, the perils of being online and offline as well. But we'll go to a few other questions and then I'd like to harp on that a little more. I hope this was okay. This was perfect, ma'am. I think um, it has given a lot of us insights. A lot of the times, uh, you know, we don't just acknowledge the loved ones around us. We do not acknowledge the fact that they will listen to us and they have the capacity to listen to us. Um, we'll talk more about that. Um, before I move on to the next questions, I am also opening the floor to all the participants. Uh, we will not be taking the questions now. We will take it towards the end of um, the discussion. But meanwhile, you all can raise your hand. And in case uh, you don't feel comfortable asking the question, you can put it down in the chat box. We would be happy to convey your message. Um, moving on to uh, the next question, which is again for Anubha, ma'am. Ma'am, um, ma we have seen that uh, the cutoffs for undergraduate courses were too high, like every single time. But this time, these circumstances were exceptional. There were special circumstances under which students have uh, given their exams. So um, we've also seen because of that, a lot of students could not perform well, uh, you know, due to the situational factors. And this has demotivated uh, many young talented uh, students a lot. So what do you suggest for these students and how do you think uh, schools or people like you all can help them? <laughs> you know, uh, frankly speaking, Arpita, like you said, many children felt demotivated. They didn't do well enough. But at the same time, let me tell you, very many children did better than expected also. You know, we talk in the... It's a pity that... We are a country where life is centered around marks. But let me tell you, when we're talking about marks and the very fact that children get demotivated, I keep telling my children, you got what you did. And I think the lessons that they learned from the pandemic are lessons which they would have never ever learned in life otherwise. You know, the marks that they got were actually better than what they had performed in every internal assessment of theirs. And what is it that always happens? Children never take their internal assessments seriously, whether it's any of their weekly tests, monthly tests, their pre-boards. And we were expected to give them marks on what they had performed. But I'm going to be saying on this platform that we gave every child more marks than they actually deserved or actually accord was not there according to the perform. Because every child, normally what they say is, we would have done very well in the boards. And that is every year. We've seen it happen. But what we've learned through this pandemic is that we are always trying to leave things for the future, the future which may never be there. So I think this pandemic has taught us to live in the present and to give your best to what you have in hand, rather than talking of the past that you've already been through and the future that we've never seen. Now, for those you say are demotivated, if they haven't got into a college, they must understand it was not meant to be, and that is it. If it was meant for them, if they had worked to that capacity and to their potential, they would have got it. And if they haven't got in, let's not be demotivated, but work harder. It was not meant to be. That is it. And they need to learn the hard way. Arpita, I'm very, very strong because the children need to learn again that it's not marks that matter in life, but it's everything else. Yes? And if they haven't got into the college of the choice, it's because of their own deeds and not for any other reason. And why were the cutoffs so high? The cutoffs were very high because 
end of the day, most boards give the children very, very high marks. I mean, it's proportionate to the marks the children actually got. And all the marks actually are doled out. So we need to understand that. So I don't think, again, for children who are demotivated, this is just the beginning of your lives and they must not get demotivated. And that is, I think, something that they need to again learn. Beautifully put, ma'am. I think that was a very fresh perspective. Um, uh, coming, like listening to this, uh, that marks do not matter and you're everything beyond marks. Your skills are what matters. It's, it's, it's a very fresh and refreshing perspective, I think, for everybody here. I remember when I got my 12 boards results long back, I started crying, whereas because I was upset, I, I felt like I, was, I didn't do good enough, but everybody, my teachers and my family, they were so How happy. much did you get, Arpita? <laughs> <laughs> I scored a 96.5. And you were not happy. <laughs> Please don't. All, I can see so many of my students here. Ronak is in class 12. I can see Nibir and Parthal uh, Junior. I mean, but 96.5, what were you expecting? 100? No, I think I scored a little bit less in English and it really uh, made me very upset. But I got into my choice of college and everything. So it went. But now again, I... Arpita, while you're <clears throat> talking of marks, I don't think any child deserves a hundred in English. This time I had an argument with my teachers. I went to the extent of saying, even if my English teacher, who's supposed to be the best in English, writes an essay, I'm never going to give her more than eight or not 10. And if someone is giving a 10 on a 10 for a composition or a creative writing, that means they could be a Shakespeare or a, a, a Tennyson or anyone else. You know, so they must not even expect more than what they actually are. Mm. Now that I look back, uh, I feel very uh, stupid for feeling that way. And, and I tell my juniors and everybody who's younger than me that don't. It, it, it's actually the truth of life. is It's the skills that you acquire that matters at the end of the day. Not, Absolutely. Not and it doesn't even matter. Are those 96.5 mattering anymore? Uh. <laughs> Absolutely not. It was just that feeling for a month or yeah. two after that. I'm like, uh, this is nothing. In fact, we <laughs> didn't put our marks up in the paper this time, or in fact, even in the school boards. And we did get children coming up to us and saying, ma'am, you haven't put up. I said, yes, because none of it was your doing. You're lucky you got it. That is it. Good or bad. No? Very nice. That was very, very <laughs> wonderful. Uh, I think every school should adopt that method now where they don't uh, put up the toppers and name and percentage of paper and everything else. Very wonderful to hear that, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, I'll move on to uh, uh, lawyer ma'am now, once again. Um, I think Afreen ma'am spoke of how we should reach out um, to our loved ones or to our counsellors or anybody whenever we feel the need to talk. But many a times we see that there are a lot of students who have access to school counsellors or help but they shy away from doing it or they do not know how to seek for help. So in such a situation, what, uh, what would be your advice? If there's somebody today in our, in our uh, webinar who does not know how to ask for help, what would you tell them? Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for the question. Uh, yes, uh, we do need to destigmatize uh, mental health because, um, you know, especially with World Mental Health Day and you going out of your way to celebrate this in such a big way. I hope, uh, I hope that students who are listening, who are hesitant to come forward, would understand that counselling is not about seeking help for people who are mentally unstable. It's not about seeking help for somebody who's got a psychological disorder. Counselling is simply talking. That's all it is. It's simply talking to someone and offloading your issues. And you know, instantly there is an, up, an upheaval and the heaviness will subside. We, we must destigmatize de this. Luckily, I, I work in World Global School and there is no stigma attached to counseling. Uh, I have a, a lot of intake coming in. And slowly, slowly, um, children must understand that you know, just going to talk to the counsellor is simply um, an educational process. It's part and parcel of counselling and it should be mandatory uh, and children should be regularly seeing counsellors. Strangely, even counsellors
just need counseling, you know. Uh, it's mandatory in countries abroad for, for counselors to seek therapy because, you know, what do we do with all this negativity that comes on us? So we need, it, the entire process is about shifting of energies and, you know, offloading of energies so that we can function better as human beings in the jobs or the, the purposes in which we have to do. So children, uh, I'm sure parents, I, I reach out to parents more than students. Parents need to understand that the tuition is not as important as the child's mental health. Because when the child goes to the tuition, they can't concentrate because they have a mental health issue. Therefore, mental health must be a priority. So many times parents ring me and say, oh, I'm sorry, we can't come on Monday at such and such time because my son has a, a, a tuition. And then I have to turn around and say to them, well, you know, if your child had the mental health issue sorted, then he would concentrate much better in his classes. And it has been proven when a child is clear in his mind, automatically his academics come up. So that relationship parents need to understand. And I think that is the crux of the matter. So once that happens, I think people will come more, more forward towards counseling and um, everyone can uh, start to destigmatize it and have it as a normal day-to-day -day occurrence of day-to-day -day life. That is what I would hope would happen in the future. Thank you, ma'am. I think destigmatization is, is, is an absolutely important absolutely. aspect. Um, so many times there is a huge, uh, you know, taboo associated uh, with mental health, especially in rural yes. areas. Yes. Any, and any, any problem that you have, if you're upset or something, it's just being, we're told to shut it away, you know, like, why are you feeling that way? Cheer up. And that is the you know, response every single time. And that's something that we really need to tackle, come out of it and learn to just talk about our emotions and feelings because we're so much more than um, you know the materialistic or the productive or that achieve the, the the achievable aspects of our life you know it's it's sure ultimately we are, our worth comes from our you know feelings our emotions who we are our what our values are so sure. that was a wonderful un uh, answer ma'am yes. uh, thank you so much um coming to afi ma'am now um I think, ma'am, if you'd want to expand more on what you spoke and uh, elaborate more on um, you know how um, students shy away from talking would uh, would be happy to have your take on that as well. Uh, but other than that, we know that you have worked with CBSE, so uh, we wanted to have your perspective on that as well. We've seen that you know there's a lot of importance uh, since time immemorial being attached to the core subjects, and uh, but now it's changing. Uh, like we heard Anubha Ma'am's and Loya Ma'am's perspective when it came to Royal Global and their students, how they are you know. Um, talking about mental health so openly and making trying to destigmatize it but uh, do you think uh, on a general level from what you have experienced so far do you think schools are now starting to give equal importance to counseling as a part of their life skills you know um, it is it is a part uh, of every school now but do you think is it just mere tokenism for some or does it go beyond all right uh, thank you that is actually a good question what I would say is this, from my experience, schools have warmed up to the idea. When I started years ago, which I mean, Anubha ma'am and lawyer ma'am would have started well before me. So they would have noticed the difference over the years. Here, I would like him to bring teachers on board. Also because you've brought in the CBSE part of it. And since I've done capacity building uh, programs for teachers, so I think somewhere along with destigmatizing this concept of counseling for students, there is a huge onus of responsibility on us to destigmatize it for the teachers. So there's been this case, uh, you know, cases where the student wants to come. I'm talking from my personal experience. And then there would be teachers who would be like, your class is more important. There goes, you know, what exactly aligned to what Anubha ma'am said. It's not just your marks aligned to what lawyer ma'am has said. It's not about, I mean, you want the child to focus in your class, let the child be calm, stable in the head. So if you're telling the child that, hey, listen, I'm not going to report, uh, you know, repeat the class for you, you miss out, you go, you miss out. Now you tell me, how do you expect, what choice would that child make at that point of time? There are marks. The child has to go home to parents. The child has to go home to tuition. Okay, and then there is this accountability. I've sent you to X, Y, Z number of places. Why are your marks this, right? So the question mark in then in a situation like that, it's a huge role is on the adults. 
more than the students because at the end of the day we are going to be setting an example and i'm just going to go a little beyond since i'm glad we have students here as well as i think quite a few adults what lawyer ma'am said about counseling that even counselors need counseling so i would you know on world mental health day say i have my own counselor who's actually one of the participants here i have invited him <laughs> okay so the thing is it's like a live example of destigmatizing this entire thing is where i would say parents teachers it's 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 a triangle you can't work alone it's like the tripod you need all the three legs together so here students think of it like this not all the time are your adults going to be correct gone are the days your parents are as human as you are they are as susceptible to make making having errors of judgment and sometimes you may be able to tell them and i think as you are learning as you are here attending such programs you are in a better space i'm not saying they never they're well meaning they will always have well meaning thoughts for you but please understand they're as human as you are and somewhere parents who are here adults who are here teachers who are here please also understand your vulnerability as a human you cannot always be right and having said that i think the, uh, as far as teachers and schools are concerned yes i would say it's going up it's an upward trend schools are more sensitized because cbse has programs for teachers so we also are sensitizing them so that they can deal with students especially first point of contact see sometimes there are things that you know you may not have the counselor at that point of time so the first point of contact is to also make the teachers counselors where they can at least take the preliminary part of it to for a teacher to even identify that this child needs to go talk you know so it's like i said it's the triangle it's the tripod so as far as i'm concerned i would say it's a positive trend and i'm very happy to say it that there has been a major shift in attitude like we use the word attitude yes it's a major shift it has been that and i'm hopeful i think we are we are all hopeful that it is heading up and that's the good thing this is the one curve that we want to see going up <laughs> no other curve absolutely i think uh, the fact that we have all three of you on board and so many parents and teachers and so many students with us today is a definitely a proof that everybody is realizing the importance of mental health and it is going up among uh, the school students as well i hope this uh, remains and the growth just um, gets bigger and bigger with time so that this is just not restricted to the urban schools but also extends to the rural areas of of assam as well um we have a few questions um uh, spriha besborwa has a question spriha if you'd like to ask it on your own you can do that as well or we can read it out um if you're here you can unmute yourself and go ahead and yeah uh good evening everyone um uh so my question is not uh, specific to any of the panelists and uh, any of the panelists i would be honored if answers this but my question is that uh, i myself is a student and what happens is that in online classes uh, it's generally a bit monotonous um plus with all the internet connections and the noise and everything uh, the classes doesn't seem as interesting as it is when we are in our offline classes so is there any particular method or any ways that we as students or even teachers can adopt to that would make classes a bit more maybe interesting uh, ma'am you're on mute yeah uh, all right uh, sorry your name uh, is uh, ma'am spriha spriha yes. uh, it's so wonderful spriha now are you making the effort on your part now you know it, it, let me say it now and i'm sure all the children students of my school will say ma'am saying the same thing first and foremost the minute you switch on your video you would see it makes a difference you know why because i always say why do we get the children to school because the teacher and the taught they need to have a connect and how do we make that connect it's not only by your name that we see on the screen it's by the your face with the minute we see you on screen we have a connect with you 
Now all the people I'm seeing on screen, it's so wonderful to see the videos on and to see the heads nodding, to see the smiles when something is said, or if, if some, we are not in agreement, I can also see some heads going sideways. In most cases, it's going up and down. So it gives me more energy to carry on with what I'm saying because I also get to know that I'm getting across to you. But when we have just two blobs and your name there, it's like me talking to the wall. I, I have no reaction, no responses. Even when I'm looking for an answer, none of you choose to answer. So what is the teacher expected to do? She just delivers her lecture. That is it, children. See you tomorrow. Period. Are you understanding? But the minute you have your cameras on, I can see you. I would want to question you. I see the lovely faces. Some, I may see a new face. And I would want to say, yes, Ghazala, what do you have to say? Yes, Radha. Yes, Anushka. You know, it feels so nice when the camera, it makes all the difference. And you would see there would be, it would be such an interactive session and automatically the lesson becomes more interesting. And yes, on our part, we also keep telling our teachers, don't let it be a monologue. Because the minute the lesson is a monologue, where only the teacher is talking, it would be boring. Online classes could be great if it's interactive, but for it to be interactive, you need to have your videos on, you need to ask questions. So I'm sure children, if you change your perspective, the teachers would be different and the lessons would be more interesting. Uh, All yes. right? Uh, Ma'am, actually we have noticed that when we switch on our videos, classes are actually much more interesting. Yes, but we don't do it. Even now, uh, 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 she's, she said so many times, please have your videos on, please have your videos on. So some of us have put our videos on, but most of us haven't. And you see, the minute you have it, I can look at you. I feel like talking to you. I may not, uh, uh, you know, even say the names of those whose videos are off, but I'll call out the names of the videos that are on. And the minute you know your name is called out, you feel so connected. And you feel, so it's the same in school. Like I always tell my teachers, and believe me, Arpita, we never say, hey, you boy or you girl with the long hair or your ponytail. We choose to call every child by their name. And the minute the child knows we are calling him by or his, his or her name, they are a different person. They feel, oh God, the teachers know me, I better behave. And school becomes a better place to go to because they feel we are all known. We are not strangers in school. We can't be up to any tricks. We'll be caught. My name would be called out. So look at the little thing, but what a difference it makes. Yes. Even now, the names I'm calling out, I'm sure you must be thinking, oh, ma'am, seen us. Thank God she knows we are attending this. We were asked to attend, but now that she's seen us, great. We've achieved our purpose. Are you understanding? It's already made a difference. So that is it. Online classes can be fun. Sitting in the comforts and confines of your home, you're getting school there. What more could you have asked for, actually? But it's us who are not cooperating, and hence the online classes are getting boring. But yes, even we as teachers, this year they're better than what they were last year. And this still, if online classes go on, we would introduce lots and lots of ways of getting across lessons by ways of padlets and mentimeters and you know all that we say we'll tell our teachers now to use these tools so that there's voting there's answers there's lovely things coming up on screen and trying to make the lessons better and better and more interesting and involved you know and more interactive spriha i hope i've been able to answer your question yes ma'am definitely thank you so much yeah Thank you so much for that answer, ma'am. I think I absolutely agree. The little thing about Connect, you know, I was in a, a six months fellowship program and it, it happened virtually because of the COVID. And uh, I graduated like yesterday, we had the ceremony. And when I looked at my, the learning and everything was all right. But when I looked at my fellows, uh, peer, the, the, my batchmates, I felt that Connect with each one of them, even though they're all from different parts of the country and I've never met them in reality. 
So that turning on that video and just seeing them react, just like we do video calls, I think. I, I'm sure all of the students here sit and do um, video calls with their friends and family and that's how they interact, you know, it's, it's just a... It's you know, a, Arpita, a, while we're talking about this, I want to give a small incident. I mean, it actually happened. You know, we are so much into online and we haven't been able to meet people. So there was a family where they had a small child. So this child and the parents were living in America, the grandparents and the child was in India, a little baby. So when she would meet her grandparents, she would call them, you know, nani, dadi, whatever, dadi, dadi, dadi. But when she actually met her grandparents physically, she couldn't believe that they were physical. She said, no, but my grandmother is on the screen. <laughs> Beautiful, beautiful, you know, yeah. I mean, mm. what I'm trying to tell you is the connect with the video on. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I think now we'll move on to the next speaker, um, considering the shortage of time and there are uh, quite a few questions. Um, the next question is by Mridhu Smita Dutta. She's having some network issues, so she asked me to ask the question. She's written, in the present scenario, how to take care of emotional health of kids in the age group of six years to eight years old? Um, any, I should not mention anybody in specific, so I think Afreen, ma'am, or Loya, ma'am, can go ahead with this question. Ma'am, would you like to go ahead? Uh, yeah, this kind of falls into my area, so I, I yes. just uh, say a few words on it, and then maybe you can also add afterwards. Uh, yeah, positive thinking. You know, there is so much. There are so many other extra skills that we need to imbibe in our children, um, and they really need to understand that um, that you know what has happened is is something unusual, but it's not something that is going to be so debilitating that it's going to break us. So we always, as parents, do need to keep a positive outlook. Uh, young children, funnily enough, are more resilient than adults. You know, they go with the flow, they accept things, they are able to adjust easily to situations. And so that is an inbuilt intrinsic quality in children. It's adults that instill fear into children because children are not born fearful. So therefore, a strangely, a younger child is an easier person to, to mold into this, the new scenario than an older person. We, we are the older ones, we have a harder time adjusting. So it's not that the younger ones really need to you know worry too much but I do think that so long as the parents have kept their lifestyles in order have kept their sleep times their meal times their study times in check if as long as the parents have kept the relationships as ma'am was saying the communication with parents with family members with friends so long as that has been kept intact throughout the pandemic and finally as long as the academics are also on track these three things lifestyle relationships and academics parents must instill that these three things are still functioning normally, regardless of the lockdown or not. Because once school starts, they will easily be able to slip into the new routine. Um, it will be difficult, but it won't be as traumatic as those children who are getting up at four o'clock in the afternoon because there's no school. They don't have a timetable. They're not having a body clock functioning. So therefore, they're going to have a harder time adjusting. Students who have been cheating in online exams, they're going to have a hard time in adjusting because they're not used to studying in the old way. And uh, children who have lost connections with their family members, they have actually lost lost a very, very big chunk of their lives because if the pandemic has taught us anything, it is the power of human relationship. It is the fact that we may value someone, you know, we value our relationships to the extent that we've lost people uh, out of the blue and so suddenly. So the pandemic does have its silver linings and one of them is the power of family relationships. And I hope, I hope that all children have been able to nurture relationships, especially with grandparents. Again, as what Ma'am was saying, because that, that bond is so precious that, you know, we often overlook it and the pandemic has given us that opportunity to stop sit back and really value what is important in life. So I hope children will also understand that and slip back into the routine of things quickly. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Um, moving on to the next question. It is by Kishkinda Das. Again, uh, she has network issues, so she's asked me to um, read it out. Good evening, everyone. Here's a little question from my side. The pandemic was an eye opener for people who didn't take mental health seriously. A new revolution was initiated to accept our own realities. How do you think 
you as a student's guide can help a child not lose this courage of theirs even after the schools reopen? I think Afreen, ma'am, you can go ahead with this question. All right. Can you just uh, give me the last part? How do you think you as, as a, a student's, student's guide? guide can help mm -hmm. a child not lose this courage of theirs even after the school reopens? I would start with self-awareness. And exactly like what lawyer ma'am said, children are more resilient as compared to adults. So the first is self-awareness. We normally have this, you know, these small little things. Remind yourself of your abilities. Remind yourself of your strengths. Remind yourself as to why you're here and how you've come this far. It's not been easy. It's not been easy. So for me to bring that courage as a child, as a child, for me to bring that courage, I would first look into, I would learn to practice, to look into myself, and then I would look for help or for support from the environment I'm coming from. So if I were to talk about uh, how do I build this courage, I would say, I would rather say, how do I remind myself of this courage? Because I already have the courage in me. It's a matter of bringing it out. Self-awareness, belief, uh, we have also things like exploring, connecting, and recreating. You have the entire platform in front of you. You have people. You have your friends. You have your family. You have your teachers, I would say, because you're attending online classes. So in that, there is this constant thing where you look for that support system and all it takes is for you to remind yourself. So I would say it starts with self-awareness. Everything will boil down to that. Be aware of your strengths and weaknesses. Be aware of the fact that we are all survivors. We have come this far and without courage, we wouldn't have. The fact that we're here today, we're talking about this. It, we're talking about destigmatizing. So for some of us here, I'm not saying all, but for some of us, I'm sure it's taken us courage to come forward. Like ma'am was saying, it's so important to have your videos on. For some of us who are, you know, a little low on our confidence, a little low on our self-esteem, it's taken a lot of courage for us to turn on our videos and be part of this entire thing. That in itself is your first step to realize, to be aware that you have it in you. Just sometimes you need the push and that push, you can get it from your friends, your family, your counselors, platforms like this when people contemporaries your contemporaries are taking such a huge step to bringing bringing out that courage to bringing it out in the open that yes we are all one in this and without courage trust me we wouldn't have come this far one one year ago i don't think we would have had so many participants i seriously doubt it that too on video <laughs> yes ma'am absolutely i think at the end of the day, what matters is to realize that we're not alone. We're all in this together and we're fighting it together. All right, moving on to the next question. Um, again, um, Asif Iqbal. Uh, Asif, if you want to unmute yourself and ask, you can go okay. ahead. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Arpita. Uh, good evening to the panelists and to the, my fellow participants. My question to the, to the panelists is concerning with the 2018 report, uh, which was released by the government. And it was recently been published on the uh, on the print where they talked about uh, the bringing uh, breakfast in the midday meal scheme. And the report highlighted that the 38 percent of the children in government schools attended. They are not uh, they are less focused in their studies. So perhaps what I feel is that uh, it may result in, into the increase in the mental illness among the upcoming generation, like the generation like who are right now in the schools. So how do you think that this report be implemented in the school? Like providing the, that facility of breakfast and other food. I think I would look at Loya ma'am for this or Anubha ma'am. Uh, I, I think Anubha ma'am, that's a <laughs> ma'am's question. <laughs> uh, uh, no, but this is, uh, this is Asif. Asif, uh, I think, uh, you know, we always insist that our children come now, now for us to speak of our students, they come from very well to do families and we do insist that they eat a good breakfast and come. Yes. And you are saying for breakfast, I mean, for the government schools and all. Yes. I mean, finally, end of the day, everyone has to have good food and enough to eat for the body to function healthily and a healthy mind and a healthy body. Yes. But 
you know what i most importantly believe where the mental health comes from is when your self esteem is low and when the children overthink more than anything else you know food i feel i don't know because i i don't know the technical part of it but i'm talking of what i understand of the children that i interact with when do we exactly have mental health problems is when our children are th overthinking they comparing they are having this what we call fomo the fear of missing out and this is what has happened during the pandemic there has been very very uh, strong relationships and bonding with the family but not with their friends and that is the fear of missing out whatever they saw was on facebook and what they saw on facebook was not the reality but that is what was impacting them and that is when they start overthinking i'm not looking as good as my friends i'm not doing as much as my friends i'm not as intelligent as them this one has gone to that one's house they are their friends they are this they are that and that is when they start getting the mental illness you know asif i don't know whether this answering your question because i feel food yes the government is looking into the mid day meal they have these akshay patras where they are providing food so there is no reason why food would not be given but it is most of the times when children do not have enough self esteem when they're not interacting with others to see that the others are also on the same platform as them that they start developing this insecurity with themselves and that is when the mental health begins i mean i'm sure when we talk of uh, Uh, you know chemicals in the brain and all that's going a little further but in most cases that i feel children start uh, uh, becoming negative is when they are overthinking and they feel that they have they are not on the same page as their friends the peer group pressure and that is what most children need to understand and believe in themselves and first and foremost they need to love themselves more than anything else yes and the minute they start looking after themselves and their bodies and giving themselves importance i'm sure life would be so beautiful asif i don't know whether i could answer your question <laughs> okay thank you ma'am thank you ma'am um, we will move on to the next question um ayushman samir uh, you can unmute yourself and go ahead with your question good evening good evening ma'am good evening to our panelists so my question is what are some ways and strategies uh, not to get overwhelmed during our stressful situations i think we can go ahead with loya ma'am maybe for this question all right thank you ayushman for that question uh, it's a very important question because uh, stress management has been at the forefront of the pandemic you know it, so many illnesses and secondary issues have happened because of the inability to handle the stress within us uh, due to uncertainty due to um, so many uh, aspects that are so new uh, as we are trudging through this pandemic so yes there is def there are definitely strategies and ways to reduce your stress um and uh let me just run through a few of them obviously there are breathing techniques i think everybody knows about breathing techniques uh you know deep breathing and all that but uh, since today is mental health day i want to tell you of some mental issues where you can use your mind in order to uplift yourself uh one of them is creating positive affirmations now i don't know whether you've heard about positive affirmations but they have been proven scientifically to work okay so basically they are small statements that you tell yourself so it's like an auto suggestion you keep telling yourself something so you know you may have a doctor that prescribes medication three times a day 
for three, a week or whatever. In the same way, psychologists and counselors would prescribe something like an affirmation that you would say three times a day for three days, and then you continue saying it twice a day for 21 days. What happens then is the energies that you that exude from you, your aura will actually change because you're beginning to say something very positive to yourself. So let me give you an example of an affirmation. I am, I am calm, relaxed, happy and at peace. That is an affirmation. I am calm, relaxed, happy and at peace. Now, if I can say every word of that statement with feeling and emotion, what I'm actually doing is changing the neural pathway of my mind and making out a new one so that the old one, the negative thinking one dissolves away and the new one is the one that becomes my new habit and my new thinking. And that is how we base our cognitive behavioral therapy on and we start to think about something in a brand new way which becomes your new way of thinking. So positive affirmations is one, auto suggestions in an, is another. Also, um, you know, um, uh, other things like positive thinking, constantly, you know, uh, challenging your negative thoughts. Every time you have a negative thought, challenge it. Say it in a positive context. Don't allow that negativity to seep into you. Recognize it and get into the space between stimulus and response. When we have a stimulus, we will always respond. But if you can intercept that space and stop thinking negatively, you can actually change the way your mind works. And that is the beauty of human psychology. So I hope that you will start to think positively and make it a way of life. Thank you for that question. Thank you, Ayushman. Thank you, Laura, ma'am. Um, I think we're running out of time, but we have two questions, a uh, few more questions, and I think we'll take the last two. Um, Udmana Das, uh, you can go ahead and ask your question. Um, yeah. So uh, I had a question specifically to Afreen, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, with the pandemic, we have seen a surge in mental health concerns of school going children as well as adults. But what are the mental health concerns even during offline mode that we don't, don't really pay attention to? Only from the year 2020 did we start paying more attention to our own mental health concern. But what were the already existing concerns that we don't talk about in our day-to-day -day lives? Even after going back to offline mode completely, what are the concerns that you think will crop up and what is the way forward if we are taking mental health awareness so seriously into our lives? All right, uh, thank you. So if I were to uh, talk about things that were happening before and that may come back, keeping this pandemic in between. A, low self-esteem issues, which ma'am was talking about. And because of that bullying. So what happened with bullying is it got transferred to cyber bullying at a higher level. I'm not saying it wasn't existing before, but because we were spending so much time online, cyber bullying happened at a heightened pace. So that is one thing we need to be prepared for. See, because we've spent a lot of time online. A lot of these people who we have interacted with, a lot of people we have spent time with on the off online mode are going to follow us in the offline mode if we are not careful. That's where predators stay. So I would say bullying online and offline is something we need to look out for once we go back. Low self-esteem issues, yes, because if I'm at home and say, for example, if I'm not maintaining a healthy lifestyle and I'm prone to, you know, I, I get overweight and then my entire uh, self-esteem for an adolescent is based a lot on how I look and the thing about how I'm perceived, like exactly what Anubha ma'am said, like, you know, this entire comparison thing, that is a part and parcel of adolescence. We've all gone through it. All right. So now I'm coming back. I'll just give you a small example. When I was in school, I came from a place that had really cold winter. So we had three months winter break, December, Jan, Feb. When we joined in March, we used to feel shy. Somebody grew fatter, somebody grew taller, and we were a little embarrassed. So it took us one week to adjust to that. Like, oh, your hair's grown, oh, you got a haircut. You know, so now you imagine 18 months and then you're coming back to school. So yes, self-esteem is a major issue that we have to look into. Bullying is a major issue. Anxiety, and uh, when I say anxiety, I don't mean anxiety of a kind where I am go going to get you know, panic attacks, but anxiety about the uncertainty 
regarding my comeback here. You know, even me as an adolescent to think that, will I be able to adjust? What will my friends say? You know, I blocked so-and-so online because I was being pestered. Am I going to be accepted by the gang all over again? You know, so those sort of things, because there was a world I lived in online. Somebody may have offended me. Somebody may have, you know, befriended me. Somebody may have unfriended me. Now I'm coming back to the entire gang in person. Am I going to be accepted? A sense of belongingness, because I've been away. So I don't know what's happening because when it's offline, we know you're in the same class. You know what gossip is happening. When it's online, you don't know who's gossiping. You don't know what conversations are happening. So what ma'am was saying, four more. Did I miss out on anything? Am I missing out? Boils down to my self-esteem. And since we're talking a lot about young children and adolescents, that is huge. The other thing I would say is coming back into the cycle of sitting in a class, the attention span. The attention span, because we got used to screen times. We got used to, you know, like we would turn off the video, maybe go drink water. I know children who would turn off the video, go do something else, come back when the class was over, right? So for me to actually sit in the classroom and give this focused attention is one thing. Other than that, the mental health concerns that I would be probably having is, yes, uncertainty, uh, the anxiety that comes with this thing, the stress of adjustment and coping, coping with what's happening right now. Because again, what where I'm coming from, if I've come from a home where my family, for my, say my parents, put this in me that, you know, you have to be extremely cautious. Like ma'am said, whether you are at home or you're in school, you can be exposed to COVID anyway. But if I'm coming from a place where there it's fear to the point of paranoia, I'm going to have adjustments coming back to school. I'm going to be on a state of paranoia. So, so the things that were already happening before, I'm not saying they're not going to happen, but I'm saying there'll be a few additions, unfortunately. There is a tendency for a few additions to happen. And that's where counseling, that's where platforms like these are so important so that children understand this. And since we have a lot of children here, there's just one, I think my, uh, what I would like to give away, you know, at this point, since we're coming to the close is this part of the fear that I worry about for the children, uh, whether it's you're spending time online, so you're, you know, this entire thing of uh, trolling, cyber bullying, it's not funny. I mean, many people sitting behind screens have had maybe some image being trolled. You've made a meme, you've circulated it in your groups. It's funny for you. It's not funny for the person. So when this person goes back to school and is, you know, there's a meme fest. Oh, guess who's made headlines for what? It's not going to work. So these sort of things are going to be the additional factors over and existing the adjustment issues that were already going on for children inside the school. So I, I think that would have answered your question or I hope it has to an extent. Is there anything I'm missing? No, ma'am, you've answered my question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I think that was a wonderful answer. We were actually, me and my team were having this discussion today um, what if somebody starts uh, doing something unruly during the meeting and we've all prepared mute, unmute and remove report and all of that. So it's not funny. It's really not funny. Thank you for bringing that, that up, actually. Um, we have a short, short time over by five minutes, but we have two last questions. Only if the speakers are willing to take it, we'll move forward. Yeah, why not? Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. I think uh, Loya has been disconnected. Yes, she messaged me, but... Um, Unmuna, can you maybe him. help her out? All right. Um, but I will move to the next question, which is by Pavika Batra. Pavika, if you are with us, you can unmute yourself and, and ask your question yourself or else I'll read it out. No, it's completely okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, and my question for all the panelists, in fact, is what are some healthy methods uh, for coping with burnout, uh, whether it be emotional burnout or academic burnout? Okay, uh, uh, lawyer is not there. Afreen, I'll say my bit and then yes. you can tell her your yes, technical bits. Yes, yes ma'am. Sure, sure. <laughs> sure, ma'am. Uh, 
you know, I, 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 I would personally feel when would a blackout, black, uh, when would you tire yourself or what's the word you used, Pavika? Burnout. Burnout. Yes. When oh, would you on. exactly burn out? You would burn out when you are stretching yourself beyond what you comfortably can do. Yes. And that is what also causes us mental agony because you are trying to, you are the one who's putting stress on yourself. You are the one who has more expectations from yourself than anyone else has of you. All right. So from my part, what I would suggest is I think we all need to take life easy. Don't put so much of pressure on yourself that you burn out. See, end of the day, at least I can speak for our school, everyone is loved. And we're not loving you for getting high marks. We love you for who you are. So don't push yourself to the brink where you think you're going to absolutely burn out and just collapse. You need to keep doing your best. You need to keep raising your bar, but do it gradually. All right. And again, it's for all of you to understand that more than the destination, you need to enjoy the journey. All right. And if you enjoy the journey, if you enjoy what you're doing, I'm sure you're not going to burn out. All right. So don't, so don't, again, for all of us, I mean, I know also why a burnout happens because we as educators, and we as parents put undue expectation on the children. And that is something which I think we as parents and educators need to understand. The minute the child knows that so much is not expected of me, I'm sure the burnout would not happen. But what we as students can do is just take life easy, but not a laid back attitude, of course. Do as much as you can comfortably enjoy it and take baby steps just to impress others don't stretch yourself to an extent where you will have a burnout all right yes uh, pavika i hope i've been able to tell you that now yes. afreen you can tell her the technical part my dear yes ma'am <laughs> thank you ma'am yeah. so yeah. pavika there are these three words that i would strongly advise which we normally don't advise but i would i have to have should and must these are the three words that actually kill all of us there is nothing you have to do if you don't want to going Very back nice. to what Ram says there is nothing you should do unless you want to and there's nothing you must do so the thing is i'll give you an example of a student saying no i have to get into du sorry what is have to here there is a difference. The moment you say, I want to, that's your intrinsic motivation. It's coming from you. I want to do it. The moment you say it's have to, you've given the control to somebody else, an external factor that will determine your level of motivation. So the moment you say, I have to do something, you have given half the control to an external factor that may or may not work for you because your motivation is not coming from you. So these have to, must, and should try and get them out of your system and look at, I want to do this because I want to study in DU, not because that's the place everybody wants to go, but because I want to go. I want to, not that my parents want me to go. My school would be happy to have me be in DU. No, I want to. And of course, there are certain things that we do, like we have certain thinking patterns that go all Oreo and all over the place either this or that. Students telling me it's IIT or nothing else. So am I to understand that all our top-notch engineers are only from IIT, what happens to the others? So these sort of thinking patterns are the ones which will actually create a lot of mess for you, ultimately making you reach that point where you are totally overwhelmed and you lose control. The moment you lose control from yourself or over yourself, you've handed it over to something else. And that will happen when you are not motivated intrinsically, when you don't want to do things, but you feel you have to, should do, and you must do it. Has Correct. it been Very helpful? Nice. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yes. Very nice.
we've not been able to uh, get Loya Ma'am on board again. There's some technical issue. This is the drawback, like we talked about of of online. Yes. But um, okay, um, one second. Has she joined? She's joining us again from her company account. Okay, we're we're trying to get her on board again. But meanwhile, there's one uh, more question, and I'll move to that. Um, it's by Ronak Chaudhary. Ronak, uh, would you like to ask your question uh, yourself? Yes, sure, sure. A very good evening, uh, Anjuma ma'am, Afreen, Mahi. Actually, she's actually my aunt. <laughs> so I'm really proud. <laughs> uh, so the, the main question which I want to ask is that uh, what are some basic solutions or ways to deal with some basic mental health issues? Because I think that's something which we all should know. Because sometimes our friends, they tend to talk to us and they, they, they are more open with us, right? Our friend. So they, they, they share everything with us. So I think we should know some basic things so that we can at least deal with their problems or something like that. One thing I would want to say before Afreen can tell you all the technical part of it is first and foremost, do not be judgmental. The minute a child okay. or your friend tells you something, don't judge the person. Yes. And you know why children, most children go to counselors and not to teachers? Because you know the counselor is not going to judge you. Whereas teachers tend to judge us. But the minute we stop judging a person, life and things are going to be so much easier. We love the person for who he or she is. Yes. So once your friend knows that you're not going to judge, and again, another second thing is confidence. You must make your friend realize that he can have full confidence in telling you what he wants to without you betraying his trust. And that too is something all of us must do. If a friend tells you something, do not go and tell your second and third friend that he, she said this or I said this. Never betray your friend's trust. If he's, if he's sharing something with you, he's doing it in full confidence. Yes. So first is do not be judgmental. Please do not betray anyone's trust. All right. Because he's telling you something in confidence. And uh, thirdly is always be kind. Don't sympathize, but empathize and be kind. Do not at any stretch of time be rude or make them feel left out. Another thing is which I feel is you, inclusion. Inclusion is a very, very important word for all of us, especially in the mental health scenario. When does mental health problems happen? When you feel isolated. So inclusion is very, very important. And I think all of us have experienced that at some time or the other. So the minute you feel you have a group and the child is not there, you have to make that extra effort of including that child in your group. So again, I'll repeat myself. Do not be judgmental. Do not betray your friend's trust and have confidence. And thirdly, believe in inclusion and never let it be isolation. All right. On to you, Afreen. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> yes, yeah. Ronak. One thing I would Sorry. like to add is listen not with the intention of answering. When Very somebody's good, yes. coming to you, it's not always that they want you to give them an answer. And technically, you may not always have the answers. That's also another point. So listen first. Don't just hear what they're saying. Listen to where it is coming from. If you want, you ask questions. But refrain from jumping to solutions. Sometimes they just want to vent out. Sometimes they want somebody yes. to... Hear them out, like yeah. listen, right? So what happens is the moment the tendency, because see, there will always be this one friend who people would call, okay, they're like our counselor, we can talk to them. So when you get that, you know, that crown that, okay, I am the one person, they all, you know, they come to me, they trust me. So the tendency for you to be on this problem solving mode will be very high. And it feels good because you feel good, you're helping somebody, but sometimes just first listen. And if you feel that you can't help the person, feel free to even say that to the person rather than masking it with something else. 
and then always refer. Sometimes these people are not comfortable going and talking to, say, a counselor or even a parent. Some issues might need parental involvement. So you may not always be a person who can keep a secret. There will be confidence, very important. But you also need to make sure that there are certain areas where you need to help your friend open up to a trusted adult which you may not be able to do sometimes. So the first that I would say is listen first before jumping to a problem solving part. Congruence is also where uh, you are, if you're telling your friend something, you please need to be that also. You can't have a, you know, I'm telling you this, but I'm doing something else. It doesn't work. Example is better than precept. You have to be that example if your friend is trusting you with it, right? And uh, thirdly, make sure you help the person reach out for help if you can't give it. And I think that is important to do it together. And of course, ma'am's taken the, you know, the most important parts as well, empathy. And, you know, you have to be confident. You have to have that, earn that. Tr and see, trust is earned. Nobody's obliged to trust anybody. So the moment somebody trusts you, please consider it as an honor. It's not, it's, a, it's an honor to be trusted by somebody with something really precious. So please honor that trust, whoever it may be. That's what I would say. Thank you so much. Answered? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you, ma'am. Uh, we are trying to get Laura, ma'am, on board so that we can have her last remarks at least. Um, but before that, I'd like to, uh, from my personal end, I, I think I would, wouldn't be happy if I don't ask my question. But it will go for both of you. This is something that I wanted to ask, beside all the questions that, that uh, we had asked already. Um, uh, basically, what are some of the social and behavioral uh, changes that uh, you, both of you as a counselor, as a teacher, or as a principal have seen in students, especially during the COVID pandemic, uh, who are going to school, you know, because we have seen a difference in, in, in their outlook, in their behavior, and how they have adjusted to the whole environment. So that technical aspect of their behavioral or social changes, what are some of those that you both might have noticed? <laughs> Ma'am, you could begin, I'll join you. All right. At the time, at the moment, we feel as if the children have come out of a cage. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you know, I mean, it's so wonderful to see them back in school, but to get, keep them seated in their respective classes is quite an ordeal. You know, they want to move. At least that's what we've experienced in the last two weeks. And I feel bad, we are getting at them, but they want to make up on the lost time. So rather than attending classes, they rather talk to each other in groups, they rather be out of the classes, they rather be on the sports field, and do everything else than sit in class. And I think another thing, it's not particularly our children, but what they've also missed out on the social skills is, how to interact with people. You know, uh, and, and for us, what's most important is when you meet a person, how do you strike a conversation also? I mean, they're soon going to forget how to do the, how to have those basic curtsies, how to uh, greet someone, how greet to someone. do everything because they haven't met people in so much of time. All that they've seen is their family, their family, and their family. You know, but it won't take long before they come back to routine and before they come back to what school was. But at the moment, this is what we felt when they came back to school, that they wanted to make up on all the lost time. They wanted to meet their friends, talk. I'm sure they had a lot, they have lots to share and do everything that they couldn't do sitting in their, in the four walls of their homes. And of course, with the little ones, we just had our PTM and the parents felt that very many of them had forgotten to speak in English. And thankfully, we said, you can't blame the school this time because for two years, they haven't been in school. They would have said, yes, school to 
English nahi bolte hai, kya kare? So I said, two years they've been with you, so don't blame the school. This was for the little babies. Parents came back to say, ma'am, they're deteriorating in English. We said, it's not us to blame. So that was, again, something that parents got back to us. And that is what we felt because they were not speaking in English, but of course, spending more time speaking in their mother tongues. So this is the little things that we felt, uh, Arpita. Uh, Arpita, as far as, uh, I don't know, I won't be able to know much to say about what happens when they come back to school. That's Anubha Ma'am's domain totally. But I can tell you what happened during the pandemic or what, you know, the months that they were there considering that there were people reaching out, uh, students and parents. Uh, withdrawn students and children many a times were being too withdrawn and parents were concerned. That was a good sign for me because the moment you have a parent who's concerned and wants to consult you for a child being too withdrawn, there, it's a red flag. It's a red flag because for, and it's so important for a parent to realize that, you know, but it's a, it's a huge red flag. And I really get scared about it when a child is withdrawn like this in the social world. Uh, the other thing is um, sleep disturbances also attributed to the excessive screen time, particularly at night because of the entire cycle getting disrupted, they're comfortable studying at night. Now, Children are comfortable. Parents are not comfortable staying up with them all night. Okay. So the screen time, we don't know what is being used for. And after that, as a consequence, when there are nightmares, when there's sleeping disturbances, when there is withdrawal, when there's social withdrawal and this, this idea of, I don't want to go back to school. I'm comfortable being at home. That also for me, to an extent is a red flag. Because a child will look forward to going back, exactly like what ma'am said, they're happy to be with their friends. Now, if a child is telling you, I'm comfortable being at home, there is more to just laziness yes, for me. Absolutely. There is more. There has to be more. It cannot be what we would call normal. You know, we, we cannot call that normal. So that is one thing. Psychosomatic issues, a lot of headaches and stomach pains with no physical issues whatsoever yeah. you do a whole battery of tests you find nothing there anxiety out and out anxiety out and out stress parental pressure because there's this now what do you have to do you just have to sit at home and study why are you not doing well uh, you know so that is another thing that is making children get more withdrawn and stressed out because like you don't have to spend time traveling you don't have to go to your tuition classes. You just have to sit at home and study. Why is it so difficult? But when you are there in that online world, you are exposed to so many things that even your parents are not aware of. Okay, so that is one thing. Uh, decreased interest in playing any sort of physical activity. More interest in being online, which again, for me, I would tell you, I repeat, is a red flag. Being online for your gaming is also a red flag when you cross the, the limits that you're supposed to, when it is, it is on a level of addiction where it concerns your parents. That is a red flag. And of course, um, the other that fears, new fears were developed. This is one thing I noticed. All of us have fears. There were certain new fears that developed after this, during this pandemic. And I fear that this fear is also coming from the online world. And that is, again, for me, a major fear because you don't know who's there and the entire predator and the sharks there grooming children, coming through so many you know, points, through your games. You're gaming with people you don't know. You have friends. You've made friends online with faces you don't know. They're just faces there, they're pictures. Who's behind that? You don't know. So I noticed this one red flag where there were a lot of new fears that children picked up. That's scary. That's scary. So the rest, ma'am, has said, they've come back to school. That's the good part. But the ones who are not willing to, they scare me. I'm concerned, really worried. That's one thing I would say. Okay, so we tried really hard with our IT team to get Laura Ma'am back on, but some technical glitch on her hand and it's just got disconnected. But uh, before we move ahead, I think uh, we had one last question um, from Nilanjana Ma'am. 
but uh, since we're running short on time, uh, I would also ask you all to maybe uh, go ahead and give us your closing remarks at the same time, if you want to touch a little bit on that question as well, where she asks basically how to ask people to seek counseling. There are cases where the child refuses counseling. So what to do in such a situation? So your closing remarks, um, and then maybe a little bit on the answer if you want to. We'll first go with Anuba ma'am and then Afri. I think my thing is the answer to everything is communication. Like Afrid also said, we need to speak, we need to talk, and we need to listen. And I love it because I also believe we need to listen with the eyes and ears, not only with our ears. And I always feel that. The other day I had a child who came to me with a panic attack. She wanted to go home. But I just made her sit in my office and we spent two hours. We went for a walk to our garden. I gave her coffee. I gave her biscuits. I gave her chocolates. And I told her, I said, let it be a day spent in the office of the principal. And believe me, after two hours, she was just fine and she went back. I said, look, you want you to go home. You have just gone home and slept. You know, here we spoke. We spoke of a lot of, lot of things, which I'm sure she wouldn't have imagined that we could speak of. But I think this was just an instance, you know. But again, children, we need to talk. We need to speak. And unless we do that, the other person doesn't know what you're going through. We all are humans. We have a good days. We have a bad days. The only thing we need to do is we need to stretch our hands for everyone. And do believe that your school also, we are your guardians in school at any time and all the time. Our rooms are open. You can enter. You can be, be, you can be there anytime. We are there for you. Be rest assured. So they need, to be, they need to feel secure. We choose to create a secure place for you where you can come and speak your heart out. And like Afri said much earlier, the minute you, we are there to listen to you, to hear you out, you can speak. And I think just listening solves a lot of problems. Listening without being judgmental, listening without choosing to answer. We are listening to understand you. All right. Very often we just listen to answer, but we may not answer, but we would listen to you. And I think that is what you would need to understand. And I'm going to be very, be rest assured Whenever we address parents, the thing that we're going to ask them is to listen to the children more and more. So that also means that all our time is for the children and for no one else. So two ways of dealing with this is to listen and to talk out what we are feeling. Unless you talk and let us know what you're going through, we will not know. So do not hesitate to ever talk and you could talk to anyone the school counselors are there your parents are there your teachers are there all of us are there but please be ready to talk and ask for help if you need and i'm sure if we do that we would be addressing mental health more easily and more effectively thank you thank you ma'am after ma'am you can go ahead uh, yes, uh, I would like to add one more element to the listening part for parents who are here on this platform. Please also listen to the silence of your children. Silence is a language spoken. So sometimes you have to take out that extra time and be a little more perceptive to a child telling you I'm fine and closing the chapter. Correct. It's not always that. So I think as adults, there is like ma'am said, you know, you make the child sit. Maybe the child may have been silent for a while and ma'am was just there throughout. And the same thing I would actually tell parents to do. You please be, a, it's tough with parents working. It's tough to, you know, give that time to your children. But the point is, please listen. Silence is also a language through which a lot of children Beautiful. communicate. Yes. You know, so please listen to that silence. That is loud. And it's a very important language children use. In fact, regardless of age, I think all human beings use silence. But silence is one of the most underrated languages, I would say. Because very everyone's good. there to fill in that silence. Everyone wants to, you know, like talk. But to, when somebody's trying to say something to silence, it's huge. It's, it's very difficult, but it's very, very, very deep. 
that message. So that's an additional thing I would tell, you know, ma'am, Nilanjana ma'am, about, you know, the silence, listening to the silence of your child. And with yes, that, yeah, thank you so much. My closing remarks would be children and parents, uh, please understand this is not one against this, the other. Like I said, it's a tripod, parents, teachers, and students. Please let us work as a team and wherever, whenever, please let us learn to talk through words and through silence. But let us make that effort. And platforms like this, I think, encourage us. We're all, I think this is one of the most interactive platforms with a, you know, an entire age and you know profession and everything mixed together. So it's, I really thank you in Arpita and the entire team, you know, for arranging this sort of an audience that everyone is benefiting. Everyone is learning. We are learning through the question. So thank you so much. This has been amazing. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I have managed to get a little voice note from Loya, ma'am, because it would have been incomplete without her closing remarks. So I'll try oh, to put great. that on. <laughs> um, if everybody else can just put themselves on mute, I'll try to work this out. Unfortunately, due to the technical hitch, the air has been unable to log back in again. But I wanted to say a warm thank you to the Indian Foundation and the team behind me, especially Sukhasana uh, and Alpita, who were in touch with me regarding the invitation. Um, I wanted to thank everyone for listening so intently to what I had to say. And uh, thank you for the questions that came our way. And more than anything, it was a pleasure. And I hope everybody will appreciate the importance of mental health and more so will seek help, help as and when they require it in the future. So thanks to everyone. May God bless you all and keep up the good work. Thank you and bye-bye. Wow, I'm so glad this worked out, but uh, without oh, her, this would have been impossible. Before we all part our ways, there's one small announcement that I'd ask Unmona Das, our project director, to make, and then we can wrap up today's session. Unmona, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to thank all our panelists, Anubha ma'am, Afreen ma'am, Loya ma'am. I've had the privilege of listening to them offline uh, during my school days and I know what kind of impact each one of them has had on me in different stages in my life and I would like to thank each and every participant for coming up joining this webinar being interactive listening understanding really taking in what was spoken here I hope we did our bit in creating an, this awareness amongst the youth which we feel was a need of the hour and that is why we had launched our mental health awareness campaign amongst the youth in Assam back in August 2021 and we continue to do so and our end goal is to really reach to the rural parts of Assam and make mental health awareness more accessible to those children and in addition to that we had also launched an artwork competition on the occasion of Mental Health Week. So the theme that we had put on for the artwork competition is Mental Health, Youth and Sexuality. The artwork can be in any medium of choice. The piece will have to be submitted in JPEG or PDF format to team anjandatta at the gmail.com. And the de deadline for the same is 17th October, 2021 the winner will get a chance to showcase their artwork in one of our upcoming projects and the artwork of the position holders will be featured in our page across all platforms there are, are a certain things to note down that number one there will be prize money and certificate for the winner number two we are accepting 2d artwork submission and number three essays and short movies will not fall into the competitions category so for more clarity, I will put this detail onto, uh, in the chat box. And please feel free to circulate this amongst all your friends. We have also sent the details to your uh, respective schools. You can approach your school office for the details as well. And if, if uh, at any point you need any clarification, feel free to reach out to either me or Arpita over 
uh, social media handles of the Anjandatta Foundation. But all in all, it was great having all of you. I would also thank Dr. Ankita Datta for giving us this platform and really pushing us to carry forward this campaign and really like uh, helping us out whenever we were confused or yes, we are all learning every day. And yes, that's how I would like to end. Thank you all. Have a good night. Thank you, Mona. I think we're just um, a young bunch of inquisitive uh, kids, I'd say, trying to make a difference, um, trying to be agents of change. And uh, rightly, Unmona said, uh, Dr. Ankita Dutta is the managing trustee, but she has very openly left the foundation to us so that we can do all the work. And now the foundation is a blend and mixture of old people and their acquired experiences and knowledge and us youngsters trying to um, goof up, but also do something good as well. So thank you so much. Uh, Loa ma'am to her as well, Afrin ma'am, Anubha ma'am, you, all of you were so approachable, so easily, um, you know, we could easily talk to you and reach out to you. Didn't, we didn't feel scared that, you know, considering our age, we, we could, you know, it would be difficult for us to have you on board. And thanks to all the participants as well. Looking forward to collaborating with all of you in the future. And if we can honestly, like, because we wanted to expand this to rural areas, if there's something that you all have to suggest us, uh, we'd be really, really glad. Uh, for that as well. You know, Arpita, the only thing I want you to say is, uh, 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 Unmona, you said 17th was the uh, last date. You know, schools are all shut. Okay. So I really don't know whether you'll get any entries. When school is open, we can push the children to participate. And okay. that is with all schools across, at least across Assam, all the schools are shut at the moment. Mm -hmm. And they'll only open on the 21st, I think, most schools. So I don't know whether you would want to extend that date or not definitely i would want to extend that this is the reason why we need the guidance of the elders because yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah but uh, thank you so much all uh, for giving us your time energy and this session will be up um, on our social media handles for more people to learn all the things that we have learned and unlearned today and yeah, once again, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so time. much. Thank, thank you. you Alpita. Thank it was you. wonderful. I would also want to thank my students. The, all the, I think what I noticed was the whole cabinet was there. The cabinet <laughs> members. I don't know whether they decided to be present or not. But I want to tell them that I've noticed. All right. And I've observed <laughs> that you were all there. Thank you. Lovely. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arpita. Thank, thank you. It was Mona. wonderful. Thank, thank you for the foundation. Thank, thank you for the invitation. It was wonderful being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Good night.